Geometry? Whoa. Disappeared. All right. Geometry is a Greek word. Geo means earth, and metria means measure, so the Greeks called it earth measurement, essentially. Uh, it is the study of the properties of space and their relations or their relationships to each other. And by space, we mean empty you know, space, but also space that objects occupy, shapes, forms, lines, dots, things like that. The smallest representation of anything in space is a point. And it's just a location. There's an infinite number of points at any given time in any given place. We represent them by a dot and we label them with a letter. So that is point A. A point is actually much, much smaller than a dot. We just can't draw it. Um, a point is so small that this dot I drew has an infinite number of points in it. They're beyond microscopic. They're tiny, tiny. Um, so they can be described, but they're not really definable. Uh, when you talk about a point, though, if we go to dimensions, you guys have heard of all th 3D movies, right? That's three-dimensional movies. A point has zero dimensions, so it's zero D. A line is an infinite set of points all stuck together so that they are so close together and they're stacked on each other that they look like this, they look like a line. And it goes on forever. So when you draw a line on a paper, you might say, oh, I drew a line, but really you didn't draw a line line because a line goes on forever. You drew like a segment of a line or a piece of a line. Lines go on forever. That's why we need to put the two arrows on the end. And we usually pick either some letter, and we say this is line M, for no particular reason, just M. I could have called it line X, line Q, whatever. Or we find two points on the line, and we call it line AB, and if we put the little symbol for a line, which is a line with two arrows on the end, that says it's a line. That tells us it's a line. If a point is zero dimensional, a line, is one dimensional. So we have 0D and 1D. And then you have a plane. And we draw a plane using a parallelogram. But it's sometimes it's easier to think of a plane as a sheet of paper. So it's flat like a piece of paper. Except this piece of paper, instead of ending at 8.5 by 11 inches, goes on forever. It just continues out flat forever and ever and ever. That's a plane. And again, there's an infinite number of points. Uh, we can either call the plane by a letter, like this plane M, and we usually put the letter of the plane that we're calling it in the bottom left-hand corner. Or we can pick three points, always three points on a plane, and call it plane A, B, C. And there's not really a symbol for that. We just have to write out the word. Um, so points are zero dimensional, lines are one dimensional, so plane is two dimensional. So 2D. So the floor is 2D. And then once you get into three dimensional, you're talking about cubes, spheres, people, desks. Right? So those are three-dimensional. And there are further dimensions. There are four dimensions, five dimensions, on and on and on and on, but we can't really picture them because we're only three-dimensional. So we can picture the things that are less dimensional than us, but not really picture, visualize the things that are more dimensional than us, if that makes sense. So you won't have to worry about any of those 4D, 5D things in this class because this is a visual class. So it's all things you can pick. What we have is space. Space is the set of all points. And as I said, there's an infinite number of points at any given place, at any given time. So space is an infinite set of points. Um, and that makes sense if you think about 
like outer space, it's infinite, right? We, the universe is infinite, so space is infinite. A theorem is a statement that we need to prove or that ha can be proven, has been proven, or needs to be proven. It's something that it's not just one of those, well, duh, kind of statements. Some things, when someone says that to you, you're just like, yeah, duh, because everyone knows it. Right? A theorem is not one of those statements. A theorem has to be proven. Now, a postulate is a statement that is accepted as true without proof. Those are the, yeah, duh, kind of statements. Make, they just make sense. They're, they're common sense. If you think about them at all, you're like, oh, obviously, that's fine. I get it. So they don't have to be proven. They're just accepted as truth. Um, between. In or through the space separating two objects. That's the technical definition of between, but between means exactly what you think. It's in between, like in the middle of. Um, to intersect is either to cross. For example, if you look at the pictures, the lines are crossing or the planes are crossing. So that's the visual representation is two things crossing. The mathematical definition of an intersection is the set of all points two or more objects have in common. So when these two lines here are intersecting, they have one point in common. So the set of all points would just include one. But when these two planes are intersecting, they're intersecting into a line. So the set would have an infinite number of points, every point in this line. So that's the mathematical definition of an intersection is it's a set of points. But the visual definition is that you're, you've got things that are crossing each other. Okay, so a ray is a straight line extending from a point and it's infinite in one direction. And now this is important. Do you see how this is A to B with the line crossing from A through B? And so when we list it, we either say ray AB or you draw a single arrow. That's not very... Okay, well a single arrow to indicate that it's a ray. Two arrows is a line, one arrow is a ray. But it's really important the order that you put things in because if I took these same two points, but I drew the ray this way, that would no longer be ray AB. This letter here, A, is always going to be the end point. And then the second letter is the next letter that it goes through. So this is ray AB because the end point is at A. If I drew it backwards, from here to here, that's no longer ray AB. This line is ray BA. Okay, so even though it's the same two points, the, the order of the letters on a ray make a difference. Now on a line or a line segment, there doesn't matter. But on a ray, this first letter always needs to be the end point. Okay, so just be really careful with that. Well, the segment, the segment is a piece of a line, so it's finite because it ends. So anytime you just draw anything like that, that's a line segment. If I don't put arrows on the end of it indicating that it goes on forever, it's a line segment. And the order of the letters doesn't, don't matter. This is segment AB. I can also call it BA. It, it doesn't matter. It's not important because it has two endpoints. Um, and a segment has just a little just a line over top of it but with no arrows on it. Okay, endpoints are the points that are at the end. So segments have two endpoints, rays have one endpoint, lines have no endpoints. And length is the measure of how long something is. So we cannot measure a line because they go on forever. So its length would be infinity. It's not really a concept. You can't really measure that. And the same with the ray. Rays go on forever, I and mean, they only go on in one direction forever, but they still go on forever. So we can't measure them either. We can only measure a line segment. A 
co means together. So, you know, like the word cooperation means to operate together. So cooperate. Um, so collinear means together on the same line. So collinear points are points that are all on the same line. So A, B, and C are collinear in that example because they're all on the same line. Non-collinear just means that you're, you're not. Non means not. So non-collinear points are points that are not on the same line. So A, B, and C are not collinear. Now I could draw a line through A and B to make them collinear, but I, there's no line I could draw that would make all three of them on the same line, because lines are straight. Um, coplanar points are points that are all on the same plane. Again, A, B, and C, same plane. Awesome. Non-coplanar are points that are not. So A and B in this example are, but C, so A and C are not, or B and C are not coplanar. Um, coplanar lines are lines that are on the same plane, and non-coplanar lines are lines that are not. So. Now, if you remember, I said that postulates are statements that are accepted as true without proof. Okay, so we've got a line and a plane contain an infinite number of points. Well, if we go back a couple pages, the description of a line is that it's an infinite set of points. The description of a plane is that it's an infinite set of points. So if those are the descriptions of the things, then it makes sense that they contain an infinite set of points. Does that? Yes? Um, for any two points, there's exactly one line containing them. Well, I don't have to prove it, but I can show you. If I take a point here, and I take a point here, I can draw a line through the two points, and there's not going to be another line that goes through, like, perfectly these two points. I mean, I didn't draw, this line's not drawn perfectly, but, you know, if I draw another line that goes over here, like this, that's not going to work, or like this, not going to work. There's only one line that will actually go through those two points. Okay. For any three non-collinear points, so if I have a point here, and a point here, and a point here, I can't draw a line that will connect all three of those points, but I can make them sit in a plane. And there will only be so if you visualize it with a piece of paper and have three points out in space, there's only going to be one piece of paper that will hit all three of those points, no matter which way. Like, it might be turned different strange ways, but there'll only be one piece of paper that will hit all three of these points. Um, if two points are in a plane, so I have a plane, and I have two points that are in the plane, well, if I draw a line connecting those two points, it's also in the plane. Does that make sense? I mean, it makes sense, right? If the points are in the plane, then the line would also be in the plane. Um, and then if two planes intersect, they intersect in exactly one line. And we already have a picture of that, so you don't have to draw it. If we go back to the intersection, see we have two planes intersecting, and they're intersecting at a line. So those are the postulates. Okay, the foundations of geometry are, it, it, geometry is very vocabulary based. It's a, it's a math that involves a lot of words. As far as math, math goes, it's, it's a very wordy math. Um, it's also got the postulates and the theorems and we sketches. And we draw pictures of like everything because it makes it easier to comprehend and to see what's going on. So what we need to do is we need to take the words and turn them into a picture. Okay, so I have point Y is on line PQ, which is on plane T. So I need to be on plane T. So first I draw a plane. And it's a parallelogram. And as you can see, it does not have to be a very pretty parallelogram. Just a parallelogram. And it's plane T, so I label it with a T. And then I need a line PQ. So you just draw a line, and you put a P on it, 
and we'll put a Q on it. And it doesn't matter, I could call it PQ this way or PQ that way, just so long as there's a P and a Q on that line somewhere. And then there's a point Y. Now I can put point Y anywhere on the line. It doesn't say it's between them. If it said point Y is between PQ on line PQ, something like that, but it didn't, it just said it was on PQ, so I could put Y right here, or I could put Y here, or I could put Y over there, it doesn't really matter, just somewhere, stick a Y. It didn't, it didn't say between, but if it, if it says between, it would have to be somewhere in this area where it is. But if it doesn't say between, you can put it anywhere just so long as it's on the actual line. I couldn't put Y out here. That's some other point. Um, but just to be able to draw that. And then, you know, eventually we'll be labeling it with various different values. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this symbol with the two arrows tells us it's a line. And so if we're going to draw a line LM, so I'm just going to draw this real quick. That means we're going to draw a line, and we're going to put two points on it, and we're going to call them L and M. Or if it doesn't have arrows, that tells us segment LM. So I'm going to put two dots with a line in between them, and I'm going to call those dots L and M. Or again, if I have one arrow that tells us ray L, M, and I have to be careful, the first letter is the end point. So, a lot of times we don't we don't like to write out big, long things. We don't like to write line segment LM or line LM or ray LM. It's easier just to put a little symbol. It makes everything faster. This is kind of what your homework for this assignment is going to be like. Um, a blank is a statement that is accepted as true without proof. That's a postulate. We're going to sketch and label a picture with the following information. So what do I need to draw first? Plane. It would help if I wasn't in the way of my scanner. So I have a plane, and it's plane W, so I'm going to put a W down in this corner. And it has points Y and Z, and those can go, you know, wherever. just so long as they're inside that parallelogram. Um, true or false, two lines intersect at a plane. Well, two lines intersect, is that a plane? Or I can do two lines intersecting on top of each other. Still not a plane. So this is going to be false. And you can only intersect with something the same dimension as you, or create something the same dimension as you, or less. So like two two-dimensional objects, or I'm sorry, in this case, two one-dimensional objects cannot intersect and create a two-dimensional object, because they're only one-dimensional. So they can either create a one-dimensional object or a no-dimensional object. It's just like two planes can't intersect and create a three-dimensional object. You can't intersect and create something bigger than yourself. So And then uh, 
two lines intersect at point H. Well, if there's any two lines, just make sure they're lines, so you have to put arrows at the end. At the end. Okay. Pretend that's the end. And then we <coughs> give them a point. We need to recalibrate. And we'll call H. Oh, yeah, I definitely need to recalibrate. I'm just going to start talking. The distance, distance is the amount of space between two objects. That's the te technical definition of distance. So when you think about distance in terms of you know, miles, miles is a measure of the amount of space between two really far away objects. Congruent means that you are the exact same shape and the exact same size. And the symbol for congruent is this equal sign with a squiggle over top. And so two congruent figures are identical in every way. To bisect is to divide into two equal parts or to half, to cut into things into halves. And a segment bisector is any, it can be a point, a line, a segment, or a plane that divides a segment into two equal parts. Parts are congruent, or you can call them halves. So any point, line, segment, or plane that cuts a line segment in half is a segment bisector. And then coordinates are the numbers in an ordered pair that give you location relative to an x and y axis. So that would be the coordinate plane. Uh, looks like this. And then there's usually a bunch of graph paper right here. And this would be the mm -hmm. x-axis is the horizontal. And then the y-axis is the vertical. And so x, y tells you where things are on that picture. So a number line is it's a visual representation of the order of numbers. And number lines are useful for mathematical operations and things of that nature. Mostly, though, it's just to show you what it looks like when you put numbers in order. To measure is to ascertain the dimensions of an object. And so typically, when you think about measuring, length is usually the first thing that comes to mind. Um, but it's not just length. It's length, it's width, it's height, it's mass, it's volume. You know, it's anything to do with weight, um, things of that nature. Midpoint is the center or middle of a figure, and it is equal distance from the two endpoints. So if we have a midpoint, so I, let's just say I have a line segment. If this is my midpoint right here, and if this is 10, then that's also going to be 10. These two distances will be the same. And then the technical definition of a ruler is a thin strip with a straight edge and markings in whole and fractional units of length. What the ruler postulate tells us, again, this is a postulate so we don't have to prove it, is that points on a line can be paired one-to-one -one with real numbers. So if we take a line, we can stick points on it, and we can pair them up with actual numbers like on a number line. So this is a number line. Okay. And then the distance between any two points equals the absolute value of the difference in their coordinates. Well, that's kind of a complicated way to do it. All right. So if we have two points anywhere on a line. Okay. I can say that these points coordinate with real numbers. So if this is one, two, three, et cetera, negative one, negative two, negative three, et cetera. I can find the distance between these two points by using the numbers that they coordinate to. Now, we don't have to throw absolute value in there. If you always do the greater 
minus the lesser, then you don't have to use absolute value. Because the reason they say absolute value is because distance is always positive. There's no such thing as negative distance. If I walk a mile forward and then I turn around and I walk another mile backward, I walked two miles. Because I walked backward did not take away a mile, right? So just always know that the distance is always going to be a positive number. So if you're doing distance and you get a negative number, there's a mistake somewhere. So what I can do is I can take B, and I, from my coordinates, B is going to be 7, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I'm sorry, 6. So B is 6, and A is negative 3. <coughs> 6 is greater than negative 3, so I'm going to do 6 minus negative 3. Well, minus and negative is 6 plus, so the distance between A and B is 9. You don't have to use subtraction. If you want to plot them on a number line, you can actually count if you want. And you can just say, okay, well, I'm here and I want to get there. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places. So you can do it that way too. It's up to you. I like subtracting, it's faster. Okay, segment addition postulate tells me that if B is between A and C on a segment, so if I draw a segment, and B is somewhere in between, that AB plus BC equals AC. So this part, plus this part equals the whole thing. Makes sense, right? That's another reason why these postulates are postulates and not theorems. Right. Mid-segment, the segment has exactly one midpoint, and if you think about that, that also makes sense because if I draw a segment, and the midpoint has to be equally distant from each side. So if I were to move in five and five, let's say, if this was whole thing was 10, well, there's only one point that's gonna be exactly five spaces from each end. If that, does that make sense? So there can only be one midpoint. That's those. Now if we use them, Okay, the ruler postulate, we can use that to find the distance between points or we can find the length of a segment using the ruler postulate. So what we do is, if I have points A and B with coordinates of negative three and seven. Okay, so A is at negative three and B is at seven. We use that ruler postulate and as I said, you don't have to use the absolute value if you always do the greater minus the lesser. So if the, that's meant to be B, not seven. Sorry, make that a B. So if you always do the greater minus the lesser, so the greater is seven minus the lesser of negative three. That's seven plus three, which is 10. Or again, you can put them on a number line like I just did and you can count the spaces and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, whichever method you prefer. Plus seven plus three equals seven. Yeah, it's, I, it's a bad seven. I'm going to write that seven. Better. To find AC, if you look at AC, AC is made up of AB and BC. AC is AB plus BC. So AB is 6, BC is 2, so AC is 8. If you look at BD, 
BD is going to be BC and CD, right? So BC is 2 and CD is 7. So we've got 9. And then AD, well, AD is all of them, right? We have the whole thing. So that's going to be 6 plus 2 plus 7. So that's 15. Not too bad, I hope. When we're told Q is a midpoint, okay, this is important information. Q being a midpoint tells me that this length and this length are the same. So that means that they're equal to each other. So PQ is equal to QR. Well, PQ is 2x minus 5, and that's equal to QR, which is x plus 3. So now I set them equal to each other so I can use solve it. It wasn't that much. That's a lot of we'll get back to it. Okay, so first I'm going to subtract x from both sides. To get all the x's together. So I have x minus 5 equals 3. Then I will add 5 to both sides. And that tells me that x equals 8. So I found x. That's this part. But then it says, then find PR. PR is this entire length. And I know that these two lengths are the same, these two sections. So I can plug 8 in to one of these, and I'll know the length of both. So I'm going to plug 8 into this x plus 3 because that one's quite simply less work. I only have to add it. I don't have to multiply and subtract. So I have 8 plus 3, so this is 11. So if this is 11, this is also 11. And if you want, you can double check it. 2 times 8 is 16 minus 5 is 11, so it does work. And since both of these are 11, the whole thing So RT is made up of RS and ST, so it's 11, not H. Oh, I made it in H. RU is the whole thing, so it's RS, ST, and TU. So it's 11 plus 5 plus 10. Not too bad. Um, now, we did an example like D with the midpoint, but we have not done an example like C. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put C up here. Okay. Um, we draw it. M is between L and N. It says between. It does not say midpoint, and that's very important. There's a difference between between and midpoint. Between is just anywhere in the middle, or in not in the middle, but in between. Midpoint is exactly in the center. So I'm going to label these. LM is 2x plus 1. So LM is this first section. That's 2x plus 1. And MN is 3x minus 2. So that's this part right here. Okay. Because it did not say a midpoint, these two things, we can't say that they're equal. They might be. It's a possibility that they're equal, but we can't say for sure that they're equal. We just know that they're there. 
and you'll notice it gives us the length of the whole line LN is 24. This whole thing is 24. What I do know is that LM plus MN, so this piece plus this piece equals the whole thing. That's all I know. So I can take this piece, LM is 2x, don't do that. LM is 2x plus 1. Right? And I can add MN to it, which is 3x minus 2. And it equals LN, which is 24. Questions so far? Okay. Now what I want to do is I have going on and I have numbers going on so I want to put all those together 2x plus 3x is 5x and 1 minus 2 is negative <coughs> and it still equals 24 And I can add one to both sides, and I get 5x equals 25. So this tells me 5 times x is equal to 25, so to undo multiplication, I'm going to divide, and x is going to be 5. Okay, and that's all we needed to find was x. So we're done. We have a line LN, and N is the midpoint, and usually whenever I know for a fact a point is a midpoint, I put this underneath it just as a reminder to myself that it's in the middle, that it's an actual midpoint. And then I go labeling it. Um, LM is 4x plus 3. Mn is 5x minus 1. And I want to find this whole length. So what I know is because this is a midpoint, I know these two sections are equal to each other. So 4x plus 3 equals 5x minus 1. Now I need to move x is over. If I subtract 5x from both sides, I'll get negative x's, which is fine. If you like to move all your x's to the left, you can do it that way. Or if you don't care, you can subtract 4x from both sides and keep your x's positive. Preference? Positive or left? The answer will end up being the same. Left. Left? Okay, we'll go to the left. So I'm going to subtract 5x from both sides. These obviously will cancel. That's the whole point. 4x minus 5x. So 4 minus 5, so that gives me a negative 1. So negative x plus 3 equals negative 1. I want to get rid of that plus 3. So I'm going to subtract it from both sides. And I get negative x equals negative 4. Anytime you have this, where you have a variable with a negative on it, but it's by itself otherwise. I want to make this positive, so I change both signs. I don't just change this sign, I change both signs. So if this is negative, it also becomes positive. If it's positive, it becomes a negative. So x equals 4. And if I had gone the other direction, I would have had 3 is equal to x minus 1. I would have added 1 to both sides, and I'd still get x equals 4. So you get the same answer. It doesn't, 
matter which direction you go, just so long as your steps are correct, you'll get the same answer. So I found x, but I didn't want to find x. I wanted to find the whole length. So I need to plug x into one of these. So I'm just going to use this one. So 4 times 4 plus 3. So that's 16 plus 3. So this is going to be 19. If this is 19, this is also 19. So ln is going to be 19 plus 19, or 2 times 19 is 38. An angle is a figure formed by two rays sharing an endpoint. So if I have a point, it's got just any two rays coming off of it, that's an angle. And an angle can be anywhere from zero to 360 degrees wide. Depending on how you're measuring. Um, we typically measure typically measure it between 0 and 180 degrees because even if an angle opens up past 180 degrees it's also got a shorter I'll explain that in a minute um, array we've already defined that and the vertex is the point at which the two sides of an angle meet so that's vertex protractor Semicircular instrument used to measure and construct angles. Semicircle means half circle. Um, so we have a protractor, and a protractor is half of a circle, and they measure up to 180 degrees. A full circle is 360 degrees. An acute angle is any angle that's less than 90 degrees, so you can be up to 89 degrees and still be an acute angle. And it's a cute angle, it's small, it's cute. A right angle is exactly 90 degrees, not 89.5, not 90.5, but exactly 90. And then an obtuse angle is any angle that measures more than 90, but less than 180. When you hit exactly 180, you're no longer obtuse, you're straight. 180 degree angle is a straight line. Essentially, the protractor postulate tells us that all angles can be measured using the numbers 0 through 180. And they can all be measured so that we get a positive number. So if the angle is facing some odd direction, normally when you think of an angle, you think of it like this. But that angle can be any direction. And we can still measure it and get a positive number using protractor. That's what the protractor postulate tells us. And that it'll be between 0 and 180 degrees. Our definition of an angle is that it's made up of two rays. So we have ray BA and BC that meet at the same endpoint, B, which is the vertex. That's the definition of an angle. Now, when you name an angle, the letter in the center, angles always have three letters, or we could give it a number, or we could call it angle B even. But, so this, this angle actually would have a couple different names. We can call it angle ABC. If you use the three letters, which you will need to do, you will need to know how to do, because we end up with multiple angles with the same vertex, and you need to know which one you're talking about. The letter in the center is always the vertex. You have to put the vertex in the center. If I said angle BAC, I would actually be talking about an angle that came down from A and went through B and C like that. So we need to be really careful with that. Now, again, since I don't have any other angles attached to this angle, I could just call this angle B 
or since I gave it a number, I could call this angle one. And that's useful, again, because when we get in the future and we have multiple angles attached together for simplicity, if you want, you can number the angles so that you don't have to worry about all the letters and getting confused on that. So just an idea for later. This angle in the center, the green one, this is a 90 degree angle. This box indicates that it's 90 degrees. That's what that tells us. And because it is a 90 degree angle, it is a right angle. The angle here to the left is smaller than that, so it's less than 90 degrees, so it is acute. And the angle to the right is larger, so it is obtuse. So it's smaller than 90 degrees, so it's acute. Can we do a circle with acute? Hmm? Can we circle it? Yeah, you can just circle it. Okay, um, then we want to find the measure of the angle, so I'm going to line up the vertex on that point. And we've got the, the line of the protractor going across here. And you can see, uh, you can't see my numbers, but you can see where it's hitting my protractor. And I'm opened to the left, so I'm reading my top row of numbers and it's hitting right at 45 degrees. So this is a 45 degree angle. So if you guys want to use your protractors and make sure that you get the same number. So we've got, we're opening out towards the right, so which one would this be? Also, again, it's bigger than 90, so it's not going to be the 50. Uh, here, there's not an exact number. We have 100 and 110, and it's about halfway. So we're going to go 105. And sometimes you have to guess. Like, if this hit right, say, here, it's between 120 and 125, so you just say, like, 120 or 123. You know, you, ha you have to guess sometimes. It's not always 100% accurate. Um, this angle? Right. And this one? 